Hello everyone, it's May 5th today. We're getting our way into the beginning of the first week of May, welcome. My name is Kelly Baldsell. I'm the owner and founder of Beyond Indigo Pets. We've really enjoyed doing these Facebook Lives every day and getting information out to the veterinary space to try to help us all navigate COVID. And one of the segments we really particularly have started to enjoy is the view from the hospital which is today. And today we have Alexander Peterson, um, owner of the Waggly Hospital um, Group. And Alexander and I have known each other for a long time. We actually enjoy many, many conversations throughout the years. And today he's gonna give us some enlightenment about what he's seeing with his hospitals on the West Coast. Um, but Alexander, tell us a little bit about you, your hospitals, um, introduce yourself to the crowd. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Alexander. We've um, Wagley's dream has always been about trying to create a special experience for for pet parents and uh, and also for for pets. And um, different from many hospitals, we our vision was to really create it around a full set of pet healthcare and services. So veterinary care, boarding, daycare, grooming, and training all all in one place. So that's what what Wagley's been all or, all about. And as I'm sure we'll talk about today. The notion of, uh, of delivering delivering an exceptional client experience is definitely in a very different ballgame in this new COVID nineteen masks and so forth world. It is, isn't it? I mean, it's it's we're writing the textbook as we're living it, as I keep saying. You know, it is for sure. And then also keeping our smile on every day. You know, some days it's easier than others. Yeah, so I think that's one of the things we do as a profession, right? I think we bring we bring something happy and positive and. When you hear it in the way in the word waggly, you know, we're, we, we want to be a, a happy brand and it's obviously hard to do that in this very serious environment. But but I do think we've been bringing a little bit kind of a, a lighter atmosphere and and a part of our, our people's lives that 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 hopefully is, is one of the things that keeps them going through uh, through all this. I agree. Now, you're, you're kind of a little bit unique because you're spread across a couple of states. What are you seeing in ge different geographical zones? Is it the same? Is it different? Well, you're right. So we're we're uh, in in three different markets: the the Seattle, Washington market, the uh, the uh, San Jose Bay Area, California market, and then Southern California, Orange County, California, south of LA. And uh, and you're right. I think it's it's even beyond states. I feel like every county, every city, uh, both has their own way to to look at the appropriate guidelines and and how to guide businesses through this period. But I also think that there's just a community spirit. And, and everyone is a little bit different. So if I look, for example, at our at our San Jose location, um, it's a very tight knit community. It's one that takes you know safety and health incredibly seriously, um, and and therefore is a little bit more on the cautious side. Whereas I think here in Southern California, I, I know you've all seen the news about the beaches and and so forth. That's very much representative of what this part of the country is all about, which is let let's try to reopen, let's get our lives back back to normal as soon as as possible. And then I would say, you know, um, Washington, Seattle, Washington, they've probably been the place that's been under this for the longest. True. Uh, they've been incredibly disciplined about it. They've done a great job at trying to manage this disease, even though they had the very first cases. They're, they're certainly not the first state in terms of number of cases today. Um, all of this impacts, you know, the demand for veterinary care and for, for pet services. So I would say that here in Southern California, I, I think it's been a little bit more resilient. Um, I think that San Jose just took a very deep breath and paused and stepped back before coming back. And I think Seattle is, is finally starting to, uh, to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So definitely a lot of variation across geographies. And I think very important that, you know, we look for ways to adapting our tone and messaging to how our clients are feeling. You don't want to come across tone deaf and, uh, you know, applaud yourself for being available for all these great services when people are just, you know, not even comfortable leaving your house, right? So it's just finding that right tone. Right, it is. And also being in three different segments, even the type of services you can offer will vary, I can imagine, right? I mean, dramatically, Kelly. Uh, we see a great, great differentiation. Yeah. So, I mean, on the, on the one extreme, veterinary care, um, I think, seems to be the place where not only do people still need health for their pets, but they need it more than ever. And we've, we've actually seen our, our veterinary practice grow tremendously through this period, which is a very strange and bizarre feeling. Uh, 
Uh, whereas on the other hand, of course, things like boarding essentially disappeared overnight. People aren't traveling anymore. Um, daycare was also, of course, hit pretty dramatically by just this sheer notion that we're all working from home and uh, at least for a while, we can bear having our, our pet with us and maybe our pet is even helping us through this difficult time. Um, so we really see every business performing separately and that's kind of new for us. I mean, we're used to everything kind of working in concert, not anymore. I really feel like Wagley is now operating as, as multiple businesses with completely different dynamics, again, by, by geography and also by, by service. Um, good news though, is I feel like every one of the pieces is, is starting slowly to come back. And as we exit the wind of optimism. situation what is up for services that you're seeing i know like around minnesota um all our shelters have cleared out so that means people are taking pets home which then they need care theoretically that that's happening what are you guys seeing on the west coast well um you know first of all as i said i think veterinary care as a whole just seems particularly busy right now and i would say that there's been a shift to a few things one is probably more serious care in the sense that there are certain decisions about preventive care that people are, are choosing to delay, um, fully understandable. Some things maybe just feel like they can wait. Uh, although I feel like we have a very important role as a profession to, to educate the community about, about this. It's not just a quote unquote wellness check, which is not a, not a word that I like particularly. Um, you know, God knows that if, 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 if there was a time to be concerned about zoonotic disease, about diseases spreading from animals to humans, it should be just right now. Right. So now is not the time to give up on, on vaccinations and, and other important things that prevent, you know, bad things from happening down the road. Um, but, but definitely, yeah. So more emergent care, um, as you said, puppies, kittens, rescues. I mean, in most of our markets, same thing, right? So our, our shelters are pretty much empty, which is a wonderful thing. We're seeing a lot of new families coming in, uh, families that often have not had a pet. So more of a need for education. We find that those first appointments tend to be longer than they used to be. Yeah. Um, and, and it's worth investing every minute, of course. Of course. Um, I do find that there's there's probably a little bit just pause for us to fine tune and evaluate where are our pet parents? Are they, are they, are they going to be able to take on this challenge? They've got this new pet at home. How's it really going? Um, and uh, I do have a slight bit of concern about what's going to happen after everybody goes back to work and, and whether uh, the, the pet is able to, to get the care that they deserve once people go back to their normal lives. That's just something to watch. But but for now, of course, it's absolutely wonderful to be able to work with uh, the cutest kittens and puppies and, and more. I love cute kittens and puppy pictures. You know, it's interesting. Um, I was just reading yesterday that a lot of the major corporations have decided that they don't need to send everybody everywhere. And in fact, like I was even reading about Nationwide, They've decided they don't need so many physical campuses because it's actually less expensive to work at home and people are actually managing it. So maybe not as many animals will come back to the shelters or they'll actually be stay at home companions because mom and dad are staying home. Maybe not what they originally thought, but you know, business, I think we're going to see some evolution in corporate, you know, or businesses in general. Um, but with that said, what's working? Well, I think, um, you know, I think we've learned a ton, right? The, the first thing I will say is what's working is just, again, discovering and rediscovering how, how tremendous our team has been. I've just been blown away by the amount of initiative and resilience and, and creative ideas. Um, it's absolutely amazing, right? The challenge that we've been dealt uh, is, is one of the hardest one I've seen in, in my business life, for sure. And, and you're seeing I will see it too, but yes. Right. Yeah, and I, I feel like you're just seeing extraordinary, extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. Um, this may not be the time to be happy, but it's certainly the time to be active, uh, and that's what we're seeing. But in terms of your question about, you know, what's working, 
I would say, uh, and you've taught us a lot about this, Kel, you and your team, communicate, communicate, communicate. Thank you. I, I just, I, I remember, you know, very specifically, it was probably the, a day or two into this thing where I was just really absorbing, trying to figure out, do we still even have a business? And and you said something along the lines of, uh, you know, don't don't be a victim about this, right? Look look into look into being finding the action here, mm -hmm. and we're trying to take that that good advice uh, at heart, and so it it certainly has started with you know just communicating very actively with our clients through every channel possible, right? Whether that's Facebook or or email, um, you know, Google My Business and so forth but also the very traditional phone call. And that's probably you know, one of the things that have worked the, the best for us, which is, you know, as soon as the, the worst of it passed, pick up the phone and call the client. And part of it might be the medical reminder and so on, but I think a much bigger portion of it is how are you doing? How's your pet doing? How are you getting through this? Um, and that empathy, that moment, I think is, is a very long-term bonding event Mm -hmm. uh, we learn from it. We learn how we can help them. Uh, they gain just a little bit of the kind of that thinking about something else that someone actually cares about them and getting out of the solitude. So I found that to be just incredibly valuable. Um, and, and just kind of repositioning from a place of just caring for the pets to also caring about those humans and, and what they're going through. And you know um, what? The longer we go through this, the more and more people are craving attention. You know, not like I need attention, just like somebody to talk to and who cares about me and everything like that. That that really, really matters. Right. And and I think beyond beyond communicating with, with our clients and of course communicating a lot with our team. I think I've been more open than ever about how our finance is doing and what's working, what's not. And we've had to uh, we have to take a lot of decisions very quickly and sometimes take a few of them back. Yeah. Just being open about it so that they know what's happening because totally. uh, we can't plan it all, I think yeah. has been very helpful. Uh, we've also found new audiences that are newly important to us that, frankly, I never thought I was going to spend a lot of time talking to, right? So the, the county health department, uh, local law enforcement, um, and so forth, where people are just trying to figure out, well, what do you guys think at Wagley about, you know, should this be open? Should this be closed? Uh, what are you hearing about PPE, the protective equipment? Is it, are you using the same as for humans or not? And, you know, does, does, do pets spread the disease? And what about grooming? Is that dangerous? And so they're just a whole set new audiences. But I think what I've realized is first, I just looked at them as, you know, regulators that define our lives. True. And then very quickly realized that they're, they're the people that keep our communities together. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also our clients. So we've seen a, seen a bit of a shift in our clients where some of our clients kind of start, started using us less often just for all sorts of good reasons. Right. Um, but then we saw clients such as, uh, such as first responders and police officers and firemen and, and medical staff using our services with a different approach. And that's been, that's been pretty amazing to be able to help them out in, this, in these tough times. It's pretty amazing because we all have something to give. It's just not all the same, same service or same tangible thing, but you know, Wagley can be there for the first responders, which allows them time and freedom of mind, not to worry about their um, pet baby at home um, to go help others, right? Because some of them are pulling long shifts. So that's awesome, you can do that. That's really awesome. Did you have some pictures to show us today? You know, Oh yeah, no, absolutely. We uh, thank you for for the reminder. We we had a, a few pictures of a uh, Frank, who's a uh, who's a cat uh, that that we just uh, gave gave a procedure to. I'll, I'll explain a little bit of the story behind this because I think unfortunately this is going to be part of our future more and more. Um, this this is a pet that uh, a Siamese cat, beautiful animal uh, that came through our door that had a series of abscesses around around the the head, probably from cat bites or, or cat fights. Um, and unfortunately, the pet parent could not afford the procedure yeah. um, and, uh, you know, asked us to euthanize this pet. And it was heartbreaking. It was like this was the epitome of the economic euthanasia that we've talked about so much as a profession. Um, we're not used to seeing it as much in our demographics in Orange County and, and the Bay Area and so forth. But we certainly are starting to get more of that now. 
And in this case, you know, the, the medical team just said, no way, we're not euthanizing this young, beautiful, well, the you know, cat was doing fantastic. Uh, and we, we asked the pet parent whether they would agree for us to, to take on the pet if, if, that was the, if that was the only alternative for them. And, and they agreed to that. So we, uh, we took on the pet and we gave it its full, full surgery. We'll, we'll see probably in the next picture uh, how, how he's uh, kind of starting to recover. And, uh, and actually on the, on the last picture here, the, the lounging around on the doctor's chair. Uh, this is a pet that's going to have a wonderful life. Hopefully will be adopted either by one of our staff members or, or by one of our clients. And I, I wanted to kind of bring that story up because I think we're going to see a lot of this. And I think we have a responsibility as a profession to, to try to guide clients to make smart decisions. Uh, we obviously can't take on every pet and, and, and we're, not, we're not a rescue. We're not, we, can, we can direct them to the right places though. We can, we can let them know where, where support exists. We can guide them through this. We can certainly also be, be generous in, at times, right? And, and, and make economic decisions that make sense for us and, and for them. Um, there's also a lot of resources out there. So I would just, you know, I think it's just something we need to be prepared for. And I think it goes way beyond COVID-19. I think the next two or three years, we're going to see a lot more of these kind of economic decisions that are heartbreaking. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's important for our culture as a company to to make make some of those right choices. And uh, we see it in all sorts of ways. Another example might be uh, boarding pets where we, we've seen clients show up and go, hey, I need six months of boarding. Well, really? Uh, let's let's take a, a month down of, of payment just to make sure we got you covered. And they go, well, I can't afford that. Well, great. Well, uh, how about you just let's, let's figure out if we can make a shorter period and can't afford that either. And you, you start to realize that what this client's issue is, is that they're not going to be able to afford to have their pet anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, being able to guide them at that moment and understand what resources are there. I mean, the one good news is what we talked about before, which is that shelters and rescues have space right now. And there right. are people adopting out there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that clients know that necessarily. And I'd much rather for them to find those resources than to have us euthanize their pet if they could find a great home. I think that's a really, really good point to take home and to kind of end this conversation with is planning for the future. You know, like, okay, our shelters are pretty much empty today, but what about tomorrow? And how do we keep these pets being healthy, viable lives with people who love them, even if they have to be rehomed somewhere else? Um, I think that's just a wonderful story. And of course, why do the cats always show us their bellies when 90 times, you know, nine times out of, nine times out of 10, they'll always swipe your hand when you go pet the belly. But, um, I think this is a really good point. And I love the fact that your team rallied around and said, no, we're not going to let this cat, you know, be put down. We, we can do something for this pet's life. Um, I think it's fantastic. Hats off to you. Hats off to your team for that. Um, any last uh, comments or anything that you've seen is everything you've received is positive from your pet owners? I mean, yes, it's it's actually been amazing. I mean, even though everything we put them through, right, really aggressive social distancing and curbside pickup and drop off and, and all these difficult things, they've been incredibly thankful just for us to be staying open. You know, I'm thankful for us being seen as an essential profession, an essential business, being able to stay open. Um, I think it's been eye-opening in terms of the role that we play as a profession for keep, just keeping society together, keeping the community together around the pets. Um, I think we are essential workers. I think we do essential work. Um, I think our clients see it and are thankful for it. I think our teams should be proud and, and we should, we should as leaders and owners take the time to thank them for what they're doing, not just for us and for the business, but for, for society as a whole. I, I think we're very, very lucky to be, you know, pet centric society at this time. I totally 100% agree with everything you just said. Well, thank you for being here today and sharing. It's been lovely. Um, it's always good just to see a view of a hospital from different perspectives. Um, and it helps to, you know, you have like the entire West Coast, little snapshots here and there. So I'm grateful for um, your insight today. So thank you very much.